And it looks like we are live. Hey, everybody, we are live with Dr. Ruthann Russo. I should probably say Dr. 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 Ruthann Russo because you are the first person that I've had on Be The Talk, Ruthann, with a quadruple doctorate in four different fields. We just had a really fun session with psychotherapist Dr. Sari Gilman, who was very much in lockstep in the same kinds of things that we're going to talk about in your bonus segment. And I wanted to give you the, the same favor of having your own dedicated segment, because that's really why you, you signed up on the calendar today. Uh, welcome to this uh, bonus episode. And actually, I'm going to hit the recorder and... <laughs> <laughs> and do all that very quickly again, if you'll forgive me for that. Sure. So this is Facebook Live. If you are in fa in healthcare or leadership or someone you know or love is dealing with these very same issues of burnout or systemic stuff or stress or whatever it is, or if you were a little disturbed the last few times you've gone to your primary healthcare provider and maybe only had you know three or four minutes with that person and you want to ask a couple of questions about that you can ask a question right on here and you want to share this is the share finger <laughs> you want to go over the share button and spread the word because we're really trying to in a positive way we're trying to enact positive change to other people that are really trying inside the system who are really doing their best to to do what they can even though their hands are very much tied I don't think anybody is going to say that the healthcare system is is perfect or even even all all that functional these days and we're really 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 trying to arm people with the resources that they need to make a difference. Uh Ruthann any <laughs> any corrections uh 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 clarifications on that? <laughs> no, I I absolutely agree with you. It is pervasive what is going on in terms of burnout and overwhelm, uh, which actually pulls from our last session, uh, but to the extent that we can all just do our own part. And that can start with just taking care of ourselves and knowing what we can do to take care of ourselves. It's a good place to start. Absolutely. So for my audio editor's benefit, if you can just uh, edit out this little disclaimer, which is totally for you. I'm actually just going to scrape the audio from this Facebook Live because I can do that because the audio is fine. I am. I just don't want to reboot this uh, with an introduction all over again just because it seems like we've done that so many times. And uh, I want to honor uh, Ruthann's uh, time right here. So if you can just edit this piece out and all of you on Facebook Live, I'm just, this is me trying to be a respectful host <laughs> here. So um, Ruthann Russo, uh, thank you so much for this bonus session with you. I know you have four different doctorate degrees. You have healthcare doctorate degrees. You have an MBA uh, or, or business, uh, healthcare business doctorate degree. You have a, uh, actually it started with your law degree. And I'm forgetting another one, I think, in acupuncture and, and alternative medicine. Uh, clarify any of those as well as tell us about the three healthcare information companies that you that you founded and grew sure and the the uh, one particular degree i think that you were searching for was uh, mind body medicine so it's you know evidence-based solid science on uh, mind body medicine and uh, the three companies that i actually founded were uh, information tech startups uh, that eventually were acquired. I did this the first 20 years of my professional career because I have a love, and I still do have a significant love for health information. You and, know, and I love you, the, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I gotta, I gotta say, I've never met anybody else <laughs> who has ever told me that they are in love with health, the e, you know, uh, electronic yes, medical records. I have heard, yeah. you know, the scourge of, you know, the new processes of, of, of these time consuming, programs and everything else so i just love that that you love this uh this <laughs> challenge that's very special <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, the very first time that i actually ever opened up a medical record right after i graduated from college and i was working in a hospital it was the first time i had seen one and all i could think to myself was wow this is the story of somebody's life from a perspective of healthcare and from that moment on, it's been, I've followed it through all paper records, through, I'm giving away my age, but through digitized and then eventually the, the EHR, the electronic health records. So yeah, and it still continues to be a, a wonderful thing. 
So we're going to get into the uh, promised topic of overcoming physician and healthcare leadership burnout. But before we do that, uh, just because I've never interviewed you before, I, I really want to hear the backstory. So if you can just take us to, to where it all started. And I know you've got all, all of these different journeys. I know you gave a recent TEDx talk, which people can look up and find out a lot of the backstory. You talk about some of the health challenges in your immediate family and the drastic and amazing changes your entire family went through with amazing results except you changed so many factors you couldn't actually go back and pinpoint what what actually made the uh, the changes but if, if it's possible for you to just in about 60 seconds somehow encapsulate all that I'd love to hear the backstory so sure and actually that backstory was uh, I was actually still working in uh, health information I was a CEO of an organization and my daughter was a teenager. She was, we so I have a son too, my husband, I have a son. And uh, he was always the one that had every sickness in the book. She was the healthy one. Mm. And she was diagnosed with epilepsy, mm. with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy with uncontrollable seizures. And uh, we could not find mm. uh, a conventional medicine solution. And in fact, her physician at NYU, um, Dr. D, we call him Dr. D, so as not to give away his name, wonderful man. He still is her conventional medicine physician at one point after about a year and a half of treatment said look there's nothing left mm. but he handed us a book that was entitled complementary and alternative therapies for epilepsy which by the way he wrote <laughs> and uh, said you know there's nothing left but see what you can do with this book and she had been having seizures sometimes you know every other week that kind of thing always without we couldn't tell when they were coming and they were the grand mal type that ended her up in the hospital and from the time that we began experimenting with these, what I now call mind-body medicine or self-care practices, she did not have a seizure for almost five years. And as you said, Nathan, it was, we just literally descended upon this book and we tried everything in that book all at once. And when we went back, we were so excited to tell him. And he said, well, you know, you were only supposed to try one thing at a time. How are we supposed to know which one? When we, we didn't care because, there, you know, she was healthy, our whole family had literally transformed as a result of this. And that's when I decided to go back to school and focus on how could we, how could I actually use this to go back into healthcare? And because at the time when she became ill, I, I left the company and spent all the time with her. You know, how can I go back into healthcare with this information that I have and use it to help patients, to help providers? And at this point where it's really led to is helping the folks at the top, the leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's where we want to take it uh, from here. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to hear the backstory of the TEDx talk as well as some of the therapies and, and practices, uh, you can um, – what, what's the name of, of the, the, the TEDx talk? I don't have that right in front of me, uh, Ruthann. Sure. It's your vital role in reimagining healthcare. And if you just yeah. Google me, my name mm -hmm. and, te and TEDx, it'll come right up. Yeah. So that's a side journey that you can take. I'm going to try to stay on point because really we want to speak to the top because I, I have a mentor who's written over a hundred books on leadership and he has a very famous quote. He says, everything rises and falls on leadership. And uh, in uh, a related segment today with another guest, we were talking about the whole challenge of physician burnout and how that there is uh, th there's not even time to uh, carve out a lunch for yourself sometimes. But the real solution to that is to realize that you're not just a physician or a nurse or a nurse practitioner or whatever your your job title is. You are a leader. And leaders do what needs to be done, including setting boundaries and carving out time and even setting physical dif distance between oneself and others. So uh, if you are a physician, if you are, especially if you are a physician who is on a board of directors for a medical um, uh, body or entity, we're talking to you. Because I, I love what uh, Ruth Ann is embodying here. She's had real uh, struggles in her family. She's overcome them. She has uh, done the hard work, and she has gone back to school to begin in a um, in 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 a, um, uh, a a way that that has credence with academia and peer reviewed and and all of the best practices. She is compiling evidence based. 
uh, evidence and data and metrics for things that work. So we're talking to you because we want to resource you with the hard conversations that we know that you're really longing to have in the boardroom, behind the boardroom, before the boardroom. We really want to resource you with some ways that you can think about overcoming change. We know healthcare does not change quickly. We know it's systemic. We know it's not going to uh, be a quick fix, and we want to expose you to ideas and people and their white papers and evidences that are going to make a difference for you. Ruth Ann, thanks for uh, indulging me that very, very long little <laughs> diatribe right there, but that's really the purpose here. Um, I, we were talking before we went live that we really want to talk to the leaders. We want to talk to healthcare leadership in this bonus segment, and that can include doctors, nurse practitioners, everybody all the way down and up the organization, but we want to talk to leaders because they are the ones that can eventually create new cultures and impact cultures through influence. So, uh, Ruth Ann, back to you. What, what are some things? What, what is your advice? I'm, I'm just going to go straight to it. Let's say you're, I mean, cause you've been in the sweet suite. You've taken companies and grown them and you've been right there in that boardroom. You've been in the top seat. How do you begin to impact change when your hands are tied, when there's no margin? When everybody's naysaying and when you're pretty fried yourself, how did you be able to get results for your companies? Great question. And short answer is one step at a time. And the other piece of that is by being an example. And that's where it does lead us right back to the leadership, Mm -hmm. right? Because we do know from the research that's out there is that leadership is essentially contagious. What the leader does the rest of the organization does as well. And so when I began looking at this issue around, you know, healthcare and knowing that there were so many physicians and other clinicians that were burned out, you know, and you look at the research that's out there, it's about half of all healthcare professionals are burned out. Ruth Ann, if you can yes. go back to the beginning of that sentence, because we had a weird little text slowdown. So oh, okay. right back and jump right back in if you can. Oh, okay. So there is a lot of research that shows that about half of all healthcare professionals are burned out. Half. Half. That, that's a big number, right? Half. So we know this is a problem. Mm. And then the first response by healthcare systems was, has been, you know, look, you need to figure out as a physician or other clinician how to take care of yourself. Oh, it's, it's, you know, go learn mindfulness or, and these, th- and I'm not saying these things don't have their role. But it's a it's a piece. And now the recent research, Stanford University, actually, medical system, which who actually has the first chief wellness officer for their physician group, has come out and they've literally shared a workable model, which says, yes, this is a piece of it. Physicians need to care for themselves. They need to be build resilience. They need to uh, whether it's meditate or you know, go running or whatever it might be. Yes, that's important and it's a piece of it. But we also need to recognize that there is an issue around the physician workflow. We don't give them enough time to do what they need to do. We expect too much around the electronic health record. So we as healthcare systems need to actually put something into place to help physicians with that, whether it's hire a scribe to document for the physician or any other literally innumerable number of interventions. That's the organization's responsibility. But here's the third piece and probably the biggest piece of this. It's literally the organization and having a culture of wellness that starts at the top. It starts with the executive team. And I will tell you that in the research that I did when I interviewed about 50 CEOs and other C-level individuals in healthcare organizations, they one of the biggest findings was the fact that they said they believed, 84% of them said, I believe that what I do in terms of my own self-care and wellness practices impact the staff in this hospital. Hmm. But uh, almost 70% of them said, I also believe that what I do impacts my patients. Hmm. So that could be, in some cases, these systems are quite large. We know they might have 12, 13, 20 or more hospitals. They could, one individual is literally directly or indirectly impacting hundreds of thousands of lives based upon what they themselves are doing. Now, when you ask them what that is, is there a structure? Is there a measurement? 
there's there's nothing that is consistent. It's kind of every man out for themselves. And there's a way that there's science out there, there's evidence out there, we can pull this together and we can create systems to help them, help themselves, and literally everybody else that they impact. Well, that was a lot. And I, I the, the key piece that I got from that, that I've never heard of before, I love that Stanford has new Stanford certified research about all this. But the new thing to me, I've never heard of a CWO, a chief wellness officer. So you had me at chief wellness officer. <laughs> is the job of the chief wellness officer, is, is that her job to, to track the data and track kind of the soft metrics that go into a hard system and 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 comprise actual outcomes or what what would you say is the job of a cwo that, that's a great question and i will tell you that this is also a sticking point in healthcare systems because even who the cwo is responsible for actually get, focusing on in terms of their own wellness varies so at Stanford right now, the focus is physicians because physicians, the cost to replace a physician could be anywhere up to the two, about $2 million based upon who that physician is, right? And we know that the turnover, it can be quite high. That number, Stanford, again, in their research shows that it's it could be somewhere over the course of two years to the tune of about 30 to $40 million. It's a, that's a, wait, a wait, huge... say, say that. I, I just, I, I blanked out on that. Uh, <laughs> say that again. 40- that... Thirty to forty million dollars over the course of two years to replace physicians who they are losing due to burnout. This is the reason why they had in two years. Mm -hmm. Wow! Right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So, so at Stanford, the focus is on physicians. Now, I will tell you that in other healthcare systems, what they are doing is saying, "Hey, it's all clinicians." Mm -hmm. So, and maybe you know that may eventually be what's being done at Stanford, who knows, but each system based on their own culture and leadership will define what that actually looks like. And what the chief wellness officer is responsible for, again, it will vary, but I can't believe that you would hire somebody at this level and not make them accountable for some mm-hmm. level of metrics mm-hmm. to literally say, Hey, what are the key metrics we're tracking? Everybody wants to know return on investment when you're looking at something like this, right? What yeah. if we're, if it's costing us a million, we want to know that we're going to get at least a million plus back. Otherwise we won't do this. And it's a tricky thing. You know, one of the most interesting things, uh, I, I worked with a, a fortune 100, uh, company last year around prevent creating a prevention of burnout program and one of the things that they would say over and over again their leadership team around the metrics was look you can't prove a negative we would what we were able to show that hey your healthcare costs have actually decreased but what they would say is well how do we know it was your program that actually mm-hmm. caused that and mm-hmm. that's that that's the challenge around trying to prove a negative as you know the old saying goes well talk universe you know some of you know that i used to adjunct professor in the field of instructional design so really what we're talking about right now is the difficulty of doing what uh, what we call a phillips evaluation a level 5 evaluation which is not mm-hmm. just uh uh um measuring the the impact of a interventional learning intervention, a training program, or whatever. When you get to level five, that's when you have to be able to have access within a system to whatever metrics and whatever systemic stuff. And very rarely do you get that level of access because it, it takes a long time to be able to get the yes. data, test the data, roll out a new plan, you know, go back and, and, and are the same people working at the facility, are the, the stakeholders still even there or does that get the whole project get shelved? That's what we're talking about right now. And that's why it's so, uh, elusive and, uh, <coughs> you know, kind of, uh, kind of loosey goosey a little bit. And I love that this chief wellness officer is going to be, you know, the queen bee or the king bee that, that is going to start sifting through this stuff. That's really what we're talking about. So that's a little bit of ID, uh, uh, tech speak to my other learning professionals out there, but just want to put this in perspective. And I also want to, before I forget to mention this, uh, to really commend to you Ruth Ann Russo's um, uh, white papers 
uh, one that was really the one that got my attention because I love the infographics in the new prescription for burnout. It's all about physician burnout. Some very, very well produced, uh, really good visuals, very good infographics, really easy to read. It's all available on her website. The other one is Leader Led Care, and her website is SOHL, the number seven, SOHL7.com. Uh, Ruth Ann, what was the HOSL? Uh, SOHL, I know that that stood for something, and I just can't quite yes. remember it. It stands for Sources of Health leadership so and the sources of health and the number seven is used because there are seven sources of health so you know knowing your life purpose Mm -hmm. attending to your mind body emotions creativity community and your environment so we address all of those from a self-care perspective and we got some good stuff going on well it sounds like really good stuff so i'm going to come right back to you go to soul seven s-o-h-l seven dot com to get access to this stuff i'm going to give you the uh the final word of advice for everybody the final word of advice is look to the top and those for those of you who are already at the top and don't know where to turn look to your boards we had talked about this earlier but the boards are really ultimately the decision makers for the organization and in this day and age we need this focus on self-care that's going to start with you as a leader and trickle down throughout the organization out to the patient base because here's the thing we're not that far away from global payment, which literally means healthcare systems will be paid one fee in order to care for patients and their patient population. So while healthcare has in the past been incentivized to, I, I hate to say keep patients sick, but that's literally the way the health insurance system worked in the past. In the future, that won't be the case. In the future, it will be how do we keep people as healthy as possible. So that's a great thing for all of us, right? Ruth Ann Russo, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and recording this bonus segment with us. Uh, all of you who are listening uh, definitely want to tune back in in a few weeks when Ruth Ann comes back, and that's when we're going to actually go behind her recent branded TEDx talk. So Ruth Ann, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so ed- audio editors, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you thank me again because we just had another funny slowdown right there. So, Ruth Ann, oh. thank you so much for coming on the talk and giving us your wisdom today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate it. appreciate the opportunity. All right, that came through <laughs> loud and clear. I'm going to hit the... Uh, the off button here on Facebook Live after reminding everybody, use your finger, not not the not that finger, use your index <laughs> index finger over the share button because there are people you know and love who have been making a difference and they need this kind of encouragement and they need to forward this to their uh, attendings, their uh, division chiefs, their board of directors who can really do something about this important issue. So we're going offline. Thank you so much.